Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so uh, as Richard said, my name is Peter and um, I'm, my presentation today is on smart contract exploits and automated vulnerability detection. So it's, uh, uh, screen. there we go. Um, so just a bit more about me. So um, the uh, sort of my research over the past year and a half, two years uh, that I've been doing my PhD has been on sort of blockchain virtual machines, exploits, uh, static analysis and fuzzing. And so I'm going to sort of, today's talk is going to sort of uh, give a bit of an intro to some of these topics and then um, some of what's happening in a sort of uh, in the research and those fields uh, at the end. And so I'm moving towards fuzzing with deep reinforcement learning. Uh, so I've just got a request for everyone. Uh, it seems like we're running low on time. So if we don't have time for questions, that's great. That's that's cool. But you can reach out to me by email. Uh, I love to sort of uh, just connect with people and just talk through different research ideas. And just before I forget, um, uh, I think it was Anne was the prior speaker. Uh, I wanted to say Definity uh, is uh, handled like the some of the DAO problems with the NNS, like six or seven years ago, and we have still haven't learned how to handle them on the snapshot. So that's really impressive. Uh, when I first discovered it, I was like, everyone's going to be doing this, and still seven years later, no one's doing it. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to be told, so we can't really talk about uh, smart contract exploits and vulnerabilities without talking about DeFi. And so in a few years, we've seen DeFi go from um, sort of one, one protocol with one product, so Maker and Dai, so that was in 2018-ish. And so for anyone who doesn't know, um, Maker and it sort of has allowed you to lock up Ethereum, or they still do, um, in sort of like uh, a, a CDP. Uh, but anyway, they lock up your Ethereum and you provide, uh, you deposit your collateral, and then it allows you to get this DAI, which is like an, uh, a stable coin. Um, it's not particularly algorithmic, although it is, it's just pegged to the US dollar and they have sort of like uh, market makers and stuff that keep it at a dollar. And so that really enabled a lot of extra things within the ecosystem um, because all of a sudden, uh, you know, you had this representation of a dollar that wasn't Tether, uh, UST. Um, and so it really just allowed a lot of other apps to sort of bloom. And eventually, just a couple of years later, we have this massive ecosystem of DeFi. And so this doesn't really even capture everything that's there because most of my research is on Algorand right now, and that's not even on this, and they definitely have DeFi. And uh, there's a lot of GameFi that isn't sort of covered here. And GameFi is like, uh, for anyone that's not aware, it's sort of like game mechanics on top of DeFi. Um, uh, and so there's all this engagement into DeFi and uh, you know, people are using all these protocols. And so the way that we measure uh, engagement in DeFi is by using what's called TVL, which is, uh, stands for Total Value Locked. So it essentially just means the total amount that people have locked into either staking contracts or uh, liquidity providing or sort of um, uh, yield farming, which is kind of doesn't really happen so much anymore, but it's where you basically just lock a token and you get a token in return. And so we can see that when um, Maker and uh, Dai actually started DeFi, it was like, it's way back here. So there was basically, it looks like there's nothing here until 2021, but really this is like a couple of billion dollars, which was pretty good at the time. And then we just saw it grow and grow and hit like 240 billion USD. And so with all this money and attention sloshing around, we of course come to hacks. Uh, and so hacks happen so frequently that when I originally made this slide two weeks ago, I had to go back and update it because um, there was about five more exploits that had happened. And so there's been 148 exploits uh, with a total value um, at the time of $4.28 billion. So you can see, uh, and I noticed Definity isn't here, so good job to the Definity team. Um, I, you can see that uh, there's sort of like Ethereum makes up the majority, and you have the sort of like um, uh, the blockchain computer that sort of gets used. We call it the virtual machine. Uh, it's sort of what exists in the canisters that they were talking about before. Um, is like different for different blockchains. But so things like Ethereum and BNB chain, they have the same compatible one. So um, they have the same kind of exploits. But what tends to happen is, is that we see this cycle happen with new chains. So they come out and I call it the new VM to exploit pipeline. So you have this new blockchain and a new VM and it comes out, it's got lots of great features. It solves some of the EVM's issues and it doesn't have the same exploits. So that's great. So uh, sort of confidence starts to build in it, it gets some traction. We get DeFi starting, you start to see more activity on chain. These DeFi protocols come, uh, the ecosystem starts heating up, the momentum builds, 
And then great, there's, there's adoption, the hype is there, total value locked increases, and then hackers start to take note. And so you start to get more attention from hackers and you start to see exploits. Now, before researching uh, exploits, I didn't realize that there was a sort of second class of exploits apart from sort of like the targeted ones. There's also, um, uh, sometimes it's sort of uh, is accidental or uh, so sort of someone might just stake into a protocol and they like do something weird by accident and they realize they get more money back. And so, um, and then they just kind of like, well, if they can get more money just by doing that, they just try and repeat that and then people copy what they're doing. And so like it becomes this sort of like little problem that drains the smart contract. Um, so there's lots, so that's sort of how exploits happen on new chains. And so the, I guess the thing that I want to sort of touch on in my research and also uh, the thing that my PhD is about really is how can we find exploits before bad actors do um, or we or people in general. So there's a couple of things that we, that are the usual approaches. So there's auditing. Auditing is the most effective um, in general. Uh, it's also sort of very, tends to be pretty expensive. That's cost prohibitive to a lot of people. Typically involves you organizing um, uh, some time with um, our organization that does sort of auditing and that may take a couple of weeks um, and sort of uh, they go through and they test your smart contract and they go through it and they have their own internal systems. Um, and then there's automated vulnerability detection, which is what we're looking at today, and which is what my research focuses on. And it's really important to note, however, that um, automated vulnerability detection and auditing actually get used together a lot. So uh, the auditors are actually some of the best developers of commercial tools uh, for um, automated vulnerability detection. So Trail of Bits uh, or Crytek, which is their blockchain sort of arm, um, actually develop a lot of the tools that we talk about. And I saw one of the posters is on Teela uh, in the, that's in the sort of blockchain salon, and that's actually developed by Trail of Bits. So I'll go through a bit of background. Um, it's kind of, a, so first off blockchain technology, it's just, I figure it's the second day of a blockchain course. You've probably got lots of great descriptions of what blockchains are and how they're made. Um, so just for our use case here, we'll just talk about it as the basis of smart contracts and sort of like where the smart contract virtual machine or uh, the computer that runs the smart contracts live. And so smart contracts you've probably also heard a bit about. Uh, I'll just give a bit of a high level overview. So typically they're Turing complete um, programs that operate on the blockchain. So by Turing complete, if you haven't heard that term before, we really just mean general purpose compute languages. Um, uh, so like they can do anything that your basic computer can. Uh, and I put the parentheses around often and generally and typical because there's so many different types of smart contracts now that uh, I mean, some aren't Turing complete um, and some aren't open and transparent and some aren't slow. Like the canisters, it sounds like a pretty uh, quick, but generally they're sort of slow and expensive. Um, I think during the bull market, uh, someone did, a, in 2017, someone did a comparison and determined that uh, storage and compute on in an Ethereum smart contract was about 3 million times more expensive than AWS, what it's worth. Um, and so that brings us to blockchain virtual machines. So blockchain virtual machines are these specialized runtime environments that facilitate the execution of smart contracts on the blockchain network. And these VMs just execute the smart contract code and manage the state transitions. And if you look at some features that they all kind of share, um, and I'm just trying to link it back to the previous talk. Uh, so they, they have Turing completeness and they have a gas mechanism, which is like the cycles that they talked about in the definity. Well, that's, that's like the reverse gas they mentioned. Um, and so the gas mechanism is important because when we've got a Turing complete language, especially when the uh, sort of like the, the initiator is paying or you just, when there's, if there's no mechanism, you could set off an infinite loop and that would impact all of the nodes everywhere. Um, and so you don't want that. So you need to have some form of gas mechanism. Uh, there's Ethereum where you pay per transaction, where you pay at the transaction time to execute it. Uh, there's the Algorand model where you where it's a single transaction fee, but there's a hidden sort of program budget inside the smart contract uh, virtual machine. Um, or there's the Definity model where it's like, when the EOS model where it's up to reverse. 
And there's a, it's important that blockchain VMs have isolation and security from the rest of the system, because otherwise uh, you don't want to impact other users and you don't want to impact the underlying node um, itself. And it's really important that they have a deterministic outcome, at least in the case where they all run on the node, uh, like Ethereum and Algorand and things like that, because uh, if they don't have a deterministic outcome and every single node runs the smart contract, if you have two that disagree on what the outcome is, then uh, you have um, a real problem when it comes to consensus. Automated vulnerability detection uh, plays a vital role in ensuring the security and reliability of smart contracts. Um, given the irreversible nature of transactions and the high value assets often involved, uh, detecting and rectifying vulnerabilities before we deploy them is really important. There's three main types of automated vulnerability detection that you'll see out there. Uh, so there's static analysis and there's dynamic analysis, which sort of has two types within it really. So fuzzing and symbolic execution, and there's formal verification, and they all have their own sort of benefits and drawbacks that we'll talk a bit about. So static analysis tools inspect the source code of the smart contract without executing them. Uh, they can identify, it can be done either on source code or the bytecode. Um, it can identify potential vulnerabilities and coding mistakes quickly. So it's a cost-effective first line of defense. Uh, tools like uh, Slither, SmartCheck, Teela, and some that I've been developing, uh, which is sort of based off the Teela framework, um, are examples of this. But they can also miss certain kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, dynamic analysis tools examine a smart contract during runtime, so it simulates interactions and transactions to identify the potential issues. Um, these tools are good because they can detect vulnerabilities that static analysis might miss and provide a more comprehensive assessment. Um, some examples of these tools would be Echidna, and so Echidna uses a process called fuzzing. Um, so fuzzing uh, allows you to generate random inputs, so you start out with a set of particular inputs and then make modifications to them based on particular algorithms uh, to be able to sort of like test them over and over again and eventually you sort of like want to test a greater level of coverage of the smart contract than you would have otherwise by just using uh, inputs that you put in. And Manticore and Mithril which use symbolic execution and it explores all the possible paths, possible paths of the contract. Um, these tools definitely can be more resource intensive so uh, if you were scanning like 144,000 um, uh, smart contracts, like it would take a very long, it would take a long time to do it with uh, sort of fuzzing or symbolic execution uh, compared to, well, especially fuzzing compared to um, uh, static analysis typically. And the third method, formal verification, uses uh, mathematical proofs to verify the correctness of smart contracts against the specifications. It does provide a high degree of confidence in the contract's correctness, but it requires significant expertise. Um, some examples of this are KVM and CERTIC. Um, and one of the things that's important to note with formal verification, though, is it's really only as good as the specifications you provide. So if you don't give it like good information going in, then you're not going to have very good information going out. Um, like uh, it can only check for the things you ask it to check for. Um, now that we've been through those uh, approaches, uh, I just wanted to go through some of the interesting ones that sort of that have really stuck with me over research. There's just a couple of approaches that we'll go through. Um, now, these are just a few. There's so many great research directions. If you're sort of doing research in this area or you want to do research in this area, or you're just interested to find out more, please contact me on my email that's on the slide deck um, if you're interested in collaborating. Uh, so the first one that really stuck with me is a paper from 2018. So it's um, called Escort, uh, Ethereum Smart Contracts Vulnerability Detection Using Geek Neural Networks and Transfer Learning. And for some reason, they always tend to have really long names for the papers. But um, the, this uses LSTM and transfer learning. So uh, it's, and it was by Lutz AL in uh, 2018. Um, it uses deep learning and transfer learning. Uh, and by combining those, it was able to do, like, it was able to outscore uh, a lot of existing models. So it was able to uh, get an F1 score of 95% on the six most common vulnerability types um, with a detection time as 0.02 seconds. So that, that is super quick. It's, it's hard to, I should have included some other data here so you can understand how quick that is, but um, it's very quick for the detection. Uh, however, the 
the challenge, of course, and the trade-off um, because they're using deep learning and transfer learning, uh, because essentially um, what they do here is they take in the uh, sort of like contract, they get the bytecode from the blockchain, and then they sort of process it, and then they use the vulnerability scanners that we talked about before. So they're probably using sort of like, uh, they said that you can switch in anyone, but they might use sort of like um, Mithril uh, or um, Slither or something like that. And so all of the time, so that's, this is quite a lengthy process. And then they obviously have to use the deep learning. Uh, they train sort of the, uh, against this data and then they can use it for the detection. So that is all very time consuming, but they use the transfer learning to then apply it to the new data set and have really good results. And I just found that really interesting. Um, another one that is sort of relatively new is effective generating vulnerable transaction sequences in smart contracts with reinforcement learning guided fuzzing. So that's by Sude in 2023. So this is pretty recent. Uh, so this uses fuzzing and deep reinforcement learning. And I'll try and give a bit of an explanation so you can explain it so uh, that it's more digestible as to why I think this one's so cool. Is because essentially we talked a little bit about fuzzing before, but one of the challenges with uh, fuzzing Ethereum smart contracts for vulnerabilities is that a lot of vulnerabilities are caused by a sequence of um, transactions. So you're really looking at like a transaction group of three or four. Um, uh, I think my screen just went off. <laughs> Do you want me to wait, Richard? Uh, there we go. Um, so just, just continue. Uh, it's it's fine. Thanks. Oh yeah, no worries. Uh, so it um uh, they use like a novel reinforcement learning algorithm plus a reward function that they've designed uh, for the reinforcement learning algorithm that considers both the vulnerabilities uh, and the code coverage already sort of uh, achieved and sort of what they're looking for. And because of this, it allows the tool to generate uh, the transaction sequences to replicate or detect vulnerabilities much faster. So it outperformed the state-of-the-art tools in a 30-minute window. Uh, it was 8 to 69% more effect, more vulnerabilities identified. And just for this last one, uh, it, uh, it's a little bit different, but um, myself, like everyone else, probably is kind of obsessed with LLMs, right? large language models right now. Um, so, And this is a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, just as a preprint, um, by Guy ALL in uh, 2023. Uh, it's called blockchain large language models and they developed they trained from scratch this uh sort of a large language model called they call block gpt as an intruder defense system so essentially they took all of this transaction data and all of this sort of um taint analysis and things like that and fed it into the model and uh they sort of created a custom data encoder and tokenization technique so we can then use those in future uh, sort of developments if we want to sort of use Ethereum and LLMs or any blockchain really that uses the same kind of um, opcode model. Uh, and then they just included or just part of this uh, intrusion detection system. So you can see that uh, they sort of feed in the normal transactions and then the block state goes in here and incoming transactions and they use that information to be able to uh, detect which ones are sort of like a uh, uh, considered to be abnormal, and then they can sort of make decisions based on that to pause the DeFi uh, to stop exploits before they happen. Because they can do this on the mempool instead of the transactions as they occur. So it just is great for um, exploit detection. Uh, and that that is it for me. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and if you have any questions, I know there's not really much time. Uh, and the references are just at the end of that. So I think they're going to release all the slides. So if you want to read more about the papers or where the data came from, you can just put the slide deck.